question that often comes up when people are discussing the Buddhist teachings on karma, which is, if there is no self, who does the karma? If there is no self, who experiences the karma or the results of the karma? Now, this question is misguided in two ways. One, the Buddha never said there is no self. He never said there was a self, but he didn't say there was no self. <laughs> and secondly, it's got the context backwards. People are trying to take the teaching on not-self as the primary context, and they try to fit karma in that. And it should be the other way around. You start with the principle of karma, that people do act, but then trying to fit the not-self teaching into that context. In other words, given that there are actions, what kind of action is not-self? What kind of action is self? These are things that you do. So the question then is, given that they are forms of karma, when are they skillful and when are they not? The karma of self, the Buddha calls I-making and my-making. You create a sense of self. You make yourself around your desires. We have a desire for happiness of one form or another. And you create a sense of self around that in two ways. One, you're the self that's going to achieve that desire, achieve that happiness. And you're also the self that has the power to bring that happiness about. Think about when you were a child, even before you had any idea of who you were, you did have desires. You saw a little block next to you on the bed, and you wanted that block. And after a while I decided that this thing that was moving around in the range of your, in your eyes that you could see was something you could control, this hand. Of course, you didn't have any concept of hand at the time, but you, whatever that shape was, you can control it. You could reach it out and you could grab the block. That hand became your hand. The block was now something under your control. It was your block. This is why the Buddha often points out that the notion of control is basic to the notion of self. Of course, as you go through life, you develop other desires, and you try to find ways of bringing them about. gaining the things that you desire, and the skills you learn in trying to attain your desired feelings or objects or whatever. That's another form of I-making and my-making. You make lots of different selves, and given that part of your sense of self is based on the things you can control things you can manipulate, your sense of self depends to a great extent on the range of skills that you have. So that's selfing as an action. And there are ways in which it's skillful and ways in which it's unskillful, to begin with based on the desire. Sometimes your desires are really harmful. And the self that's created around those desires is an unskillful self. It leads to a lot of suffering. Even things that are relatively skillful, you find that you latch on to them and then they disappoint you. And so you have another way of creating a self to try another desire and keep on going, creating more selves all the time. The problem is these selves have to keep on feeding. So even when they're relatively skillful, they're 
there's always this element of feeding, there's always this element of stress inside them. But there's a skillful side to these things as well, skillful selfing, when you develop attributes that the Buddha actively encourages. Heedfulness, the ability to see that there are dangers lying down the road, and you have the ability to avoid them if you're careful. That's a skillful sense of self, a sense of self-responsibility, self-reliance. As the Buddha said, the self is its own mainstay. In other words, you have to depend on yourself to straighten out your mind. You can't depend on other people. The sense of self that knows restraint, realizing that if you don't say no to certain desires, there's going to be trouble. So you learn how to say no to your desire for immediate gratification in the interest of greater happiness down the line. That ability to see it in terms of verse from the Dhammapada. If you see a greater happiness that comes from letting go of a lesser happiness, you're willing to let go of the lesser happiness for the sake of the greater one. That's basic wisdom. And it's a skillful kind of self that can do that. One way you might say that you have lots of different selves, and some of the selves can train the other selves. The self that formed around an unskillful desire can be trained sometimes by a self that forms around a skillful one. So it's not the case that selfing is always bad. Sometimes you hear people saying that if people realize that their self caused nothing but stress and trouble, they'd let it go. Well, if it caused nothing but stress and trouble, they would let it go, no problem at all. But there are forms of selfing that are beneficial. As we all sense, it's by having a sense of what we can do, what skills we have mastered. The abilities we identify with, that's how we find our happiness tell people just to let go of that strategy, and they're going to say, well, how am I going to find my happiness? It doesn't work that way. This is where that other activity comes in, the perception of not-self. And this is something we've been actually doing all along, things that we realize are not under our control that are opposed to our sense of self, we perceive them as not-self. It's a dividing line that we create all the time. Where there's self, there's going to be not-self. And that, too, can be either skillful or unskillful. You learn how not to identify with certain unskillful desires. That's a useful use of not-selfing. But then there are times when you deny responsibility. You say, I'm, I didn't do that. It was already broken when I stepped on it. I didn't mean to when you actually did. That kind of denial is very unhealthy. The skillful use of not-self is when you see that some form of identification is actually leading you to stress and suffering, actually causing you harm, and you learn to say, no, that's not me, that's not mine. So both selfing and not selfing can be either skillful or unskillful, and a large part of our training is learning how to sort those things out. Like right now, as you're sitting here meditating, you're doing this because you see there are benefits that are going to come down, come down the line from training the mind. Trying to bring the mind under control, that's a form of selfing right there. Each time you catch yourself wandering off, you drop that, that's a kind of not-self, and you come back and you self with the breath. 
This is all based on the principle of restraint, the principle of heedfulness, also the principle of what they call sublimation, the ability to separate a more skillful pleasure for a less skillful one. And compassion, or what the psychologists call altruism. You say that this is a form of happiness which doesn't harm anybody at all. In fact, the more self-reliant you are, the less you weigh other people down this way, the more you can depend on yourself not to get knocked off, knocked off course by pain, illness, aging, disappointment. This resilience that you can develop through the powers of concentration, mindfulness, and discernment. It's a form of happiness that's good for everybody, for you and the people around you. So all of this is healthy selfing. That's where any distractions that come up, any defilements come up, you learn how not to identify with them. That's healthy not selfing. As you keep this up, your powers of concentration get more and more refined, get stronger and stronger, until you're able to use them to let go of a lot more radical things. Deeply ingrained habits, old ways of selfing that are, have been constantly bothering you parts of yourself, they keep coming back and coming back. You use the concentration, you use the discernment to learn how not to identify them. And that requires developing these other skills. There's no way you can just drop things, drop one form of selfing, unless you can replace it with another set of skills, which is what we're doing right here. Ultimately, when the concentration has done its work and you've let go of everything else that would destroy your concentration or knock it off, off balance. Then you can start turning around and looking at the concentration itself, seeing that it too has limitations. You start applying the process of not-self, or what they call the perception of not-self, to this as well. And that's one way that you can break through the de to the deathless. So it's helpful to realize that it's not the Buddha saying there is or isn't a self. It's look at the way you self as a verb, as a form of karma, and develop a skill, skillful sense of self, a wholesome sense of self that helps create the karma that leads to the end of karma, the kind of selfing that leads to the end of selfing. You can do that only by finding a happiness that's totally free from conditions. In other words, you don't have to do anything further to gain it. At that point, any need for any sense of self is set aside, because after all, you've been selfing because you want happiness. Once you find ultimate happiness, there's no need for those selves anymore. No question of selfing and not selfing gets put aside. So the question isn't, if there's no self, who does the action or who receives the results? The question is, given that there are actions, what kind of action is selfing? What kind of action is not selfing? When is it skillful? When is it not? What skills can you develop to develop a skillful sense of self and learn how to use the process of not selfing in a skillful way as well? So ultimately you can get to that state of happiness, that type of happiness, unconditioned, unlimited. We can put all this selfing and not selfing aside.